Dostoevsky. I've been working around, in and around the knowledge management field for about 20 years. Some as a pr practitioner, now I do uh, coaching and consulting for organizations that are trying to make change, either personal change for themselves and their leaders or organizational change. And so we're going to talk about change today. I am a, uh, a neurotransformation coach, so I, I am a, a certified executive and leadership coach, but I also, um, people have hobbies, I love to cook, but I also love neuroscience, and so I've been doing neuroscience kind of as a hobby, and also a certification program for about four years. So today we're going to talk about the brain and change, and some things as a manager that, um, we only have 45 minutes, so we're going to focus on three things that you need to know, and then a couple of, I guess, considerations or strategies that if you're going through change in your organization, some things that you might want to consider implementing. And I have two resources at the end that, um, that I'll pass on to you. Um, so, because I'm, I'm only going to really, you know, scratch the surface on this. So if you want to have a little bit more in depth, um, you can certainly do that. Also at the end, um, I've got some business cards up here and I've got some sign-up sheets for, um, if you want to have a copy of the slides, let me know. I also periodically put out a neuroleadership oriented newsletter, um, different tips and things about what's going on with uh, emerging research on the brain and how that impacts um, how we can live and lead a fully effective life. So if you're interested in that, I've got some sign-up sheets here. And I also have a one-pager on some of the work that I do as far as workshops and coaching goes. I, I have a number of more detailed workshops. And again, like I said, we're, I don't know where the audience is coming from, so this is going to be a little bit general. And I'd like to get your feedback at the end of whether, whether you need a deeper dive or not, or, or is this, you know, did you learn something here? Okay. So we're going to get onto it, leading effective change. Um, let me start that. All right, so our intention today, I guess I should be looking at this slide, um, three things that you should know about the brain and then what to do with those. So once you know them, how can you do something with them that can create more effectiveness in your organization? I'm going to tell you a little bit, a little story, and this goes back from my KM days. This is um, uh, several years ago, more than several years ago. But when I was working um, with, as part of a working group with a, with a university, um, and you know, you got to teach, you got to publish, you got to research, you got to do all that stuff. Well, there's a lot of publications coming out, a lot of research being done, but it was all stovepiped. I know that doesn't happen in organizations anymore because we fixed all that um, in the knowledge age. So um, the, the president of the organization wanted to have more visibility over what was being put out, what kind of research was being done, um, some more collaboration in the culture, um, some more tag teaming on research to produce better documents, better, better uh, proposals, better research um, papers. And so we were trying to put together, you know, framed out a really nice way to integrate all of these writings and these research topics and these abstracts so that, you know, they can be searchable. And, you know, if you're doing a paper on um, Israeli-Palestinian relationships, well, wouldn't it be nice to know that the guy in the economics department just did something about the economic impacts of that? And wouldn't that make your stuff stronger? So we presented this. Um, the leadership loved it. And then we got, whoa, the pushback from everybody that actually does the research and writes the papers, right? I don't know if any of you are in education, but, you know, there's, there seems to be um, people just resist sharing. Um, so that was my real first entree, I guess, into big resistance to change in organizations. And it kind of got me started on um, wanting to figure out how, how we can make change more effective in organizations. And, you know, so a bunch of schools and everything else. And here I am today. Um, I think now that we have some more research around and findings around neuroscience, we're actually able to see why we resist change so much and what we can do about it. So um, neuroscience uh, is the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's a fairly new uh, discipline, and there's research and uh, um, uh, tests going on all the time, and we're finding new things. <laughs> so, so this is an emerging area. So I, I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you is, is a little bit basic and general. Um, it, and it has to do with, a, um, I guess, a healthy brain versus there's a lot of 
um, mental disabilities and stuff. And so what we're going to talk about doesn't necessarily apply if you have a mental health issue. Um, so I'm not getting into that level of it. But we're really at the tip of the iceberg on um, looking at what the brain can do and its impact on how we lead our lives. So I'm going to talk about um, three things today, the brain, the body, and the mind. And I just wanted to distinguish between them so that we're all on a kind of a common language. Because the, um, talking about the brain and the mind is often used interchangeably, and they're really not. The brain, when I talk about the brain, I'm talking about that three-pound piece of matter in your skull. And speaking of tip of the iceberg, we're also finding that there's neurons, the brain cells, that are in our gut and throughout our body. And there's a neural nerve that goes from our right hemisphere of our brain down through our heart and our gut, the, called the vagus nerve. So what we used to think of as the brain being here is actually the brain throughout the body. Um, and when we're talking about the brain, we're actually talking about the neurobiological piece. Um, when we're talking about the body, we're talking about our senses. The body is how we experience the world. So when some of you first walked in here, when I walked in here, I thought, oh my gosh, it's cold, right? And so you're rubbing your hands. Your body's experiencing what's going on. You're hearing me. You're seeing me. You're feeling the temperature. Uh, maybe you're tasting something, hopefully delicious and sweet over there. <laughs> um, and and that's, that's how our brain knows how to respond. It's, it's taking all the se those senses that our body is feeling, and it's doing some processing on it. Um, the mind is a compilation of that. Uh, Dan Siegel, who was the, uh, he's the author of Mindsight and several other books, he was the one that really came up with this concept that the mind is an entity of its own, and it, it's a combination of brain and body, and in my words, what we do with that. So it's what we do with what's going on in our brain that is the mind. His definition is the mind is an embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information. An embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information. So again, it's like kind of what we do with all these different senses that the brain and the body are giving us. And so we're going to talk more about that in a bit. A um, couple of brain facts here. They're always fun to know. So the brain is 73% water. So even a 2% drop in hydration in our bodies is going to impact our brain. So if, you've, um, if you're doing a lot of uh, caffeine and not a lot of water, even though caffeine or coffee, tea is a liquid, um, that also has a diuretic effect. So you've got to look at your hydration. If you're going to go and um, really perform well, whether that's a sports thing or at work, you've got to be hydrated because any drop in that is going to impact how you show up and how, you, how your brain can process what the inputs that you're taking in. Um, brain contains 86 billion neurons. I don't know how you can count those, but evidently somebody has. And each one, so each of those neurons, which is the brain cell, connects with 46, what is it, 40,000 40, synapses. So the synapse is the connection between two of those neurons. And so it's always trying to, you know, pass this information around. Think of the volume of that data that's coming in and how do you make sense of it, which is where we run into this resistance of change. So the brain is generating about 500,000 thoughts a day. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with zeros today. What is going on? Um, 50,000 thoughts today, and about 70% of them are negative, all right? And that'll come back in another slide, too. Um, and so I told, I told you about how we're finding that the brain is not just here in the skull, that is throughout the body. Your gut contains 100,000 neurons. So it's, you know, our brain is actually throughout our body. It's not just right here. 2% um, of our body weight, it weighs about, it weighs about three pounds, but it uses up 20% of our energy. So it needs 20% of the energy that our body takes in to operate. And that'll come up again, too, in, the next, in another slide. Well, I, I, sometimes if I have more time, I do a little experiment on the multitasking. Because your brain really can't multitask. It has to do one thing or the other. It can switch quickly, but it loses effectiveness as it goes on. And I, I have a little like, like thing that we do, but that's, that's for another workshop.
Um, and our attention span, they've recently, I think two years ago the research came out, uh, we have the attention span of, um, of a goldfish. So eight seconds, and then you're on to something else. So think of that when you're trying to capture someone's attention, and you really want them to remember what's going on. You've got about eight seconds to do that. Otherwise, their mind is on some of those 50,000 other thoughts that they're trying to think about. <clears throat> so here's a couple of things that managers should know, and we're going to go into a little bit more detail on each of these. So we're geared to threat detection and survival. Um, we like to see patterns, and we love to swirl around on negative stuff. Oh, that does look okay. So when I printed this slide out, I got multiple lions, and that's really scary. Um, <laughs> So first of all, our brain is geared to detect threats. Now, you know, back, back in prehistoric time, there were a lot of threats. And if you didn't survive, then you as a species, your lineage would, would die off. Well, we're probably not living in as high a threat environment, although some people, you know, that have been to some countries, you know, Syria or some, you know, some places in Africa, which, you know, there's a, there's a constant threat. You know, think of what happens when you're in that kind of a situation where your town, your village is being bombed all the time, um, where there's constant fighting. Think of the threat situation that you're in. Now, having said that, you know, we live in a pretty nice place. We got food, you know, we got nice temperature, we got safe rooms, and yet we still have this problem with this big threat, this threat detection that's going on. And so what happens when we're, when we're detecting this? We have that typical fight or flight syndrome, right? So we detect a threat and our body does one of two things. It goes toward it or it goes away from it because we want to be safe. So if we think that we can survive it or sometimes we have no choice and we have to fight, we are going to go toward it and try and fight it. If it's safer, if it's better for us as a species, as a person, um, to save our lives, to save our, our, uh, our energy, our self-preservation, we're going to try and run away from it. So that's the fight or flight. And it, there's a little bit more complexity to that, but for our purposes, that's, that's what we need to know. So we're going into this danger zone, and we're constantly scanning. So our body's scanning. Um, we're trying to interpret if what we're seeing is dangerous or not. Is this something I have to pay attention to? Um, if you've ever been in a situation with um, a colleague you had a really difficult time with, has anybody ever can think of somebody at work they have difficult relationship with? Yeah. So even though that person, not, I don't want you to think of them as a lion, but um, you know, even though that person's not a lion, you still have a reaction. So getting back to the body and how it, it's perceiving the threat, if, uh, if you hear that person's voice down the hall, hopefully they're not in this room, um, if you hear that person's voice down the hall, pay attention to what happens in your body. Do you get a little like thing in your gut or is there a tightness in your chest or your shoulders feeling really heavy? Um, maybe it's a clenched jaw, maybe it's a furrowed brow. Maybe there's a little bit of um, tenseness in your, in your body when you hear that voice. So that's a trigger because that person has been a threat to your self-preservation. They're not going to come, I hope, and um, do anything dangerous, although in workplaces these days you don't know. Um, but they are a threat to your self-efficacy, to your self-preservation to your dignity, to the respect you feel, to your opinions, the value of your opinions, and, and that is as much a threat, your, your mind perceives that as much a threat as a real threat of physical harm. Any questions so far before I just keep running on here? Okay. So, <laughs> um, who lives or works in an environment they consider stressful? Oh, only a couple of you, really? Okay, all right. Yeah, there's some stress. So what makes, what makes the environment stressful? What, what shows up? Anybody? People? <laughs> People show up. Okay, so every person has got their issues, right? Okay. What else? What else makes environments stressful? 
Computing priorities change. Deadlines, yeah. Some deadlines can be energizing, but if it's a complex project, competing priorities, and, you all, and they all got deadlines, whoa, that's, you know, that's a trifecta there. So, and we have um, people and their issues that come in. We have our own issues that come in. So we live in a stress, what we're doing right now is stressful because our bodies have to adjust to whatever temperature the room is. And, and maybe you can't really tell, but if this room was 55 or if it was 105, you would definitely be under some stress trying to adjust. So, you know, stress is a part of life, and I'm not saying we, we're going to live without stress. It needs to be identified of what is causing extreme stress. So what happens under stress is a bunch of chemicals get generated by the brain, um, and, you know, back when we're trying to fight or flight, these are really good for us because what they're doing is they're elevating our heart rate, increasing our breathing. We're trying to get more oxygen in, get more blood flow. It's shutting down the processing of our internal organs so all that energy can be pushed out to our extremities. So if we have to fight or flight, we have the energy to do that. And what that also does is it's taking some of that 20% of the energy that the brain needs from what we're processing, and it's taking some of that and pushing it out too. And, you know, after the moment's over, if, you were, if, you know, if, if, there's a, if there's a big crash behind us in the room, you know, people will jump and go, oh, wow. You know, and you'll feel that, that kind of elevation. Well, after it's over, it's like, oh, okay, you know, we're back to normal, usually. But if you're in an intense stress environment, or a chronic work stress environment, um, these keep on going. And the, particularly the cortisol. So the cortisol can stay with us in our body for 24 hours or more. It doesn't dissipate on its own unless it's got oxygen to help it dissipate. So, so that's why when, when people are under stress, one of the first things that, that a coach or a or a mental health professional will tell you, well, you need to breathe. You know, you need to bring more oxygen in to dissipate those stress chemicals. Because otherwise, your brain is, is being bathed with all this stuff, which, which really creates foggy thinking. I have a whole other workshop I do on the prefrontal cortex and, you know, how stress impacts that. Too much stress can be impactful. Too little stress can be impactful. So there is that kind of perfect place of, having enough stress to be engaged and energized and having too much stress. And most of our workplaces and unfortunately some of our homes are in the too much stress category. And so this is, there's this constant generation of um, these neurochemicals and if you can't, if you don't take actions to get rid of them, they produce long-term um, autoimmune deficiencies um, heart disease, high blood pressure, I mean, all the physical things, there's, there's physical things that happen, and also foggy thinking, inability to prioritize, lack of impulse control. So when you see somebody that's high under stress and they're just like ping, high under stress, what do you do when you, when you have a lot of stress going on in your life? What, what's your, what's your go-to thing? Work out? Oh, that's great because that's, that's getting more oxygen and getting rid of it. Walk, okay. So some people eat, right? So people under stress, you know, they grab the thing of ice cream or the chips or the cookies or like, I'm under stress, I need to have something, I need to have, well, you know, food is good, but probably you're taking the wrong kind of food. Um, so, so there's that, that pattern of reaction to how we deal with stress and, it's, and that is not mitigate. Things like working out, exercise, walking, taking a break, breathing, those are ways to effectively deal with stress. Unfortunately, we have, um, many people have a history of going to something else, whether it's food or alcohol or um, medications to deal with stress, which is not really helping the long-term um, problem. Any questions on that? Okay. So point number two, our brain likes to fit things into patterns. Um, we're processing a lot of data all the time, a lot of information coming in. Our brain has got to figure out, okay, what's important and what's not. So the more it can patternize something, the better. 
So things that happen over and over become patterns in our brain. If, um, if Janet comes in every day and she seems mad, she's angry about something, well, in our minds, we're saying, oh, well, that's angry Janet. Because one or two times we interacted with her and she seemed kind of angry. So we've, we've put that into a pattern. And what that does in relationships is it makes it very one-dimensional. We never ask, like, why is she mad? You know, why does she appear angry? Does she even know she appears angry? Is there something going on at work or at home where she, that is causing that? You know, we don't even go there. We just create this pattern. And it happens with everything. It's, like, it's kind of like name that tune. Can you, can you name that tune in two notes? So as soon as the brain triggers on, oh, oh, I know that person. You know, oh, he's, he's the one that's, you know, that thinks he's really smart. You know, so what are we doing? We're creating this story and this barrier to actually getting to be open and know this person. So our brain likes to create patterns. And a lot of these patterns have been with us a long time. And in, actually in coaching, a lot of times we get into these discussions about, uh, and, not, and not to you know, do the whole Freudian thing like you know, it was your mother's fault or something. But you know, when we were growing up from the time we were a baby, we had to survive. And so we adapted behaviors that allowed us to survive. And if, if you grew up in a, a home where there was a lot of shouting and anger, maybe your survival was to withdraw. And so when you're in a conflict situation, maybe you get really quiet, which is unusual. Maybe, maybe that's your coping mechanism. But again, you know, we've created these patterns of behavior and patterns of thought that become very deeply embedded in our brain. And it's like changing the Colorado River to actually change them. So if you've, if, if you've ever tried to establish a new habit or get rid of an old one, you know how hard it is. It, it takes little steps at a time, and it takes a long time to rewire. Um, the rewiring of the brain is called neuroplasticity, and it's very, very possible to do. It just needs constant reinforcement, and that's a whole other workshop that I do on neuroplasticity and the five factors around it. Um, but just know that we, we have this tendency to develop patterns. And so you'll see patterns of behavior show up in people at work. You yourself have patterns of behavior, and maybe you're not even aware of them. It's just, it's just who you are. So if you're, if you're not getting the results that you want, maybe it would be helpful to ask somebody that you trust to say, you know, what kind of patterns are showing up? You know, how do I respond that is creating something that's ineffective for me? So sometimes you've got to have that level of trust at work, and, and some workplaces are not like that. But if you have that, if you're lucky enough to have that kind of um, relationship with someone, it's always nice to get some exterior feedback on how you're showing up. Point number three, our minds love to spin around on negative stuff. It's like a vortex. It's like this swirling whirlpool. whirlpool. You know how a tornado, when it comes in, it starts picking up all the stuff that's not nailed down? Well, that's what happens with this negativity. And if, if you can think of somebody in your office that is toxic, you know, I mean, it's, it's like, oh, my God, that person walks in the room and, and the energy level just, everybody's on pins and needles. Nobody really wants to say anything to trigger. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's bosses out there that think that that's, you know, that's the way to be. Um, if you know somebody that's, uh, that's an Eeyore type, Oh, woe is me, it's never going to happen. Oh, have it, so it, there's always a reason why we can't, it, it's not going to work, right? So that's what I'm talking about here. We love to swirl around on it. And if we don't have all the information, we're going to make it up. And most of what we're going to make up, remember that 70% of thoughts that we spend on negative thoughts? Most of what we're going to make up is going to be negative stuff. So when we get into what, what, what can you do, communication. And, I, and I, you know, you've got to emphasize that over and over. You've got to communicate because otherwise people are going to make it up. Even if there's nothing to communicate, tell people that. At least you've closed that door. And, they, and they're not going to sit and um, talk about, oh, well, I'm not being asked to do this. I, you know, I think he doesn't like me. Did I do this wrong? Should I, should I have talked more? Should I have talked less? You know, you, you can just go down this drain hole and, and never see how to get out of it again. And, and, you know, I think we've all known people like that. 
And no matter what you try and help them with or do, it's, it's not going anywhere. Whoops. I guess that's a build somehow. Okay. Um, and like I already mentioned, our brain spends far more time processing negative inputs. Because, you know, remember, it's designed to detect threats. And yeah, it's always nice to see, you know, unicorns and flowers and all the good stuff. And it's like, oh, that's great. But it's really designed to detect threats and for us to survive. And so no wonder it spends more time trying to figure out the negative stuff in our life because we're trying to protect against it. So it's a natural tendency. And what's cool is once you know that that's a natural tendency, now you can be kind of the observer of it and go, oh, yeah, I'm, my mind is spinning around right now. Yeah, I got to stop that because that's not effective. Before you knew that, it was probably like, oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, that's just the way it is. That's my reality. That's what I deal with. Um, so to get back to that, like, why we spend so much time um, making up the negative stories, you know, six, well, there's, there's models that have more emotions, less emotions. But six basic emotions. Five of them are actually negative energy words. One of them is a positive. So when you think of how we're defining things in our life, I, 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 uh, I had a client as it was an IT um, director, and they wanted to um, establish a better relationship with their customers. So he was, you know, doing this change thing about, you know, better customer management, customer relationship, more open. And he was using words like, well, we have to do damage control and, okay, team, we've got to get in there into the battle. I'm like, are you, you're, are you listening to what you're saying here? You know, all of a sudden, we're trying to, like, be customer-oriented, and yet we're treating this like, like we're having a battle with them. So you've you got to have the language. You know, you're using some negative language, yet you're trying to do this positive change thing. So we've got to pay attention to the emotions and the words we use. Um, Rick Hansen, who's, who's big in the, uh, in the brain world, he's got a couple of great books out about brain and, and how how we uh, show up in the world, says that we're Velcro for negativity and Teflon for positivity. So if you think of negative, something, something that negative has happened in your life, and you can probably recall the emotion that you had, the feeling that you had, what was going on in your body when that incident happened. That gets imprinted really fast. Now think about something that happened in the last couple of days that was really good. Mm, you might have to think a little longer about that one. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, that happened. Was that good? Yeah, that was good. You know, but if you think of something, some negative incident, that's going to come to you right away. And you say, yeah, damn. You know, and, and you're even going to maybe clench your fist or, you know, steal your eyes. So in another workshop I do, we, we have the seven, lever, uh, seven levels of organizational and personal effectiveness. And we talk about below the line, impact, or energy, and above the line. So when you look at these, these words over here, the below the line words, hopelessness and anxiety and, and uh, anger and frustration, what's coming up for you there? What are you feeling? Hmm? Angst? Yeah, I mean, just the words themselves are kind of like, ugh. There is this protection mechanism. I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to feel frustrated. I already do enough of that at work. You know, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to be blamed. I don't want to blame others. So there's this, this kind of closing in that happens. Now if you look at the words above the line, you know, courage and resilience, openness, synergy, harmony. What's coming up there? Hope, maybe? Opportunity, possibility? So, so there's just a, a, a lightness of this above the line. And so whether we use um, the term energy or, you know, I like to use impact or effectiveness because that's what we're all about in organizations, trying to be more effective. As leaders, we're trying to have an impact on getting results and taking care of our people. So when we're down here below the line, that capacity to have an impact and be effective is really closed off. And that is because we're letting that threat detection and all that negative stuff that it's, the mind is deciding to glom onto drive our lives. And so in, in some of the work I do, we, 
we go through this model of stepping up above the line and how do you get there and, and where do you want to be in order to get the most effective results. So we just went over three characteristics of the brain and the mind and how, how it responds in a, a changed situation. And so what are we going to do about it? So if you want to have your change initiatives, whether that's an individual thing that you as a manager are doing with your team or whether you're involved in an organizational level change, how do you, what do you do about what you just found out? So the first thing is remember that change is a threat. So anything that takes us from the homeostasis of our, our comfort zone, what we know every day, is going to be, the brain is going to look at that as a threat. Now it's going to evaluate, is that a threat that I need to act on? Or is that something that, okay, I can, you know, I can deal with that and, and move on. So, so there is some evaluation and assessment that goes on. If our brains are cleared, if we're working in a chronic stress environment and we have all of those um, neurochemicals going on, the cortisol, the adrenaline, norepinephrine, um, it's really hard to have clarity of thinking to put that negative bias aside. So the other thing that happens um, out of this information is that we all see things differently. So every one of you here has got a different colored glasses on. So even though we might have grown up in the same town, went to the same school, went to the same college, went into the same career, we're seeing things very differently because of our culture, our background, how we grew up in our families, our genetics. Um, and so that's something else to remember. A lot of times in organizations we deal with change and say, okay, we're all going to go do this. And some people are like, okay, you know, it doesn't seem like too much of a threat to me, so I'll go along with that. And other people are like, oh, no, 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 that ain't happening. That's not happening. So understanding that each one of us is processing this differently, and if we default to our patterns where we create these one-dimensional images of people, then we never get to see that, Rose is wearing rose-colored glasses, and Jack is wearing green-colored glasses. So here's five things that you might want to consider if you are creating some kind of a change in your organization. And I'm going to go through each one of these a little bit, and then we'll have some time to discuss at the end. And there's a, uh, a reference I'll give you for more information on this, because, so, again, I'm just kind of going over it very quickly. So the first thing is that change is a social endeavor. So one of the most important things to, to set up is social and psychological safety. So we want to run away. We, people want to run away from things that they think are going to harm them, that they feel are a threat, and we want them to run toward things that are safe, right? We want to, we want to be safe. So how do you create change as a safety area? So something to consider. Um, the second line there, personal reputations are at stake. So what happens a lot of times in change is because we don't know what's going to happen, we feel threatened because I don't know if I'm going to have a job after this. That happens a lot. I don't know if I'm going to be working in the same organization. Maybe I'll have a new boss. Maybe I'll have a new team. Maybe I'll be in another office space. I mean, some of these things like... Moving cubicles, that sounds pretty low, but that's a, that, that's a high threat thing. All of a sudden, you're changing my physical space and my environment and who I interact with, and I have to create new patterns in my brain. So as simple as it seems to put out a memo and say, oh, you know, Jack, you're moving from cubicle A to cubicle 23 over here, that's a big thing. And so people need to have their concerns acknowledged. So knowing that any kind of change you're going to do has a potential um, status implication, creating that psychological and social safety is important. So whether we do that through working groups, we do that through um, getting feedback and input, um, somehow you've got to account for that, that loss of um, that potential, remember, threat, loss of some kind of social um, social status. Knowing. 
So even when there's nothing to know, the idea that you're being told, so this gets again into communications, we need the certainty of knowing. So a lot of managers don't, you know, well, I don't know anything, so why should I, why should I say that? You know, I, we don't know what the end state's going to be. We don't know when the decision, we don't know if the government's going to shut down. Um, unless that's come out, yeah, they haven't figured that out, right? Um, but we need that certainty of even not knowing that you have the answer. So, and, and this, you know, this puts a manager in a, in a kind of a difficult situation because managers want to know the answer, right? They want to show that they know what they're doing. But if you're up there saying, well, you know, I don't really know what's going to happen, but I will tell you. So, so all of a sudden, there became a little bit more certainty around, oh, I trust this guy or gal because they're going to keep me informed. Even if they don't know, they're going to tell me that they don't know. And, and I'm okay with that. If I don't have that information, that knowing, what do I do? I make it up. I create my own story. I worked in an organization once that was going through a major, major reorganization, um, recoding positions, all this stuff, and it was all done behind closed doors. Nothing came, it was rumored that it was being done. And so you know what happened? I mean, we're talking about weeks of non-productivity, barely making deadlines, nobody, everybody was afraid to collaborate because they didn't know who, you know, who was getting axed next or who was getting moved. It was, it was a really toxic environment. It was the worst change effort I've ever, ever been involved with. Uh, anyway, um, so remember, we're processing a lot of stuff in the brain. And so we're doing our job, and this change stuff is happening. You're like, oh, well, I, I talked about it in the staff meeting. OK, fine. And I go out and back, go back to my work. But you know, is it really relevant to me at that moment? So our working memory which is where we draw these five to seven things that we need in order to get stuff done, can only hold a couple of things at a time. So if you're throwing out this information about this change at a staff meeting or in a memo, and you did it once, so check that block, that's not going to happen. So the most, the most successful organizations, or the, most, the organizations that have had the most successful change what, that I've found is the leadership, and they always say walk the talk, they repeat it over and over and over again to the point where they said, that I've told them a million times. I said, yes, and tell them a million times and one. Because that information about that change and that impact or whatever it is that you're trying to move them toward has to get embedded in their working memory so they can go into the long-term memory and change behavior patterns. If it's just put out at a staff meeting, that's one of the problems. Oh. I told them, how come they're not doing it? Well, because they got all this other stuff that they're working on, including their normal job, plus, oh, we want to move the organization to this different process or this different structure or this different mission set. A little bit of overwhelm. So another factor, we don't like to lose control. We like our independence. We know, we know where we're sitting in the office. We know who we're interacting with. We know what our processes are. We know this. We don't like to lose control, this unseen fat force that's moving us into a different direction, and we're not quite sure what's, how it's going to end up. We don't know how it's going to impact us in the long term. So we don't like, like to lose control. So factor that in. You know, how do you keep people engaged so that they feel like they are part of the solution? You know, sometimes, sometimes it has to be directed, but a lot of times we can engage the people that or in the organization to create that change. And it might turn out differently than, you know, as a manager I thought it would. And it will probably be much more effective because people will be involved with it. So just remembering that we don't like to lose control. Um, there's also this idea of the in-group versus the out-group. And we're all doing that. I mean, we do it subconsciously. We create an in-group based on gender, race, um, who's, wearing, uh, who's wearing black today? Who's wearing gray? Who's wearing red? So we got an in-group of people wearing red. And so we're going to have a lot of in-groups, and then there's the out-group. So the people not wearing red are in my out-group. So I might not have as much um, sympathy, not sympathy, that's the wrong word, empathy for people in the out-group. But I'm going to really like kind of be cohesive with the people in my red in-group. 
And this happens all the time in change. Some people get, get the information. Some people get a little bit of you know, better office space, you know, whatever it is. Um, just be aware that the in-group and out-group phenomena happens in, in organizations. And how can you create more people on the in-group and less people on the out-group? And then finally, um, we need to feel like we're being treated fairly. So some transparency. And, and I realize, particularly in, in organizational changes, um, you've got HR issues, you've got legal, legal issues. I mean, there's some things that you can't share. But as much as possible, there needs to be that feeling of trust between the organization's employees and the leader to feel that they are being taken care of and people are being treated fairly. So there's, there's nothing we like less than to think that somebody else is getting something that we're not. Um, so being as transparent as possible about the change. So I am at the end of my time now. I'm going to give you the, uh, the two resources that I think are pretty interesting. If, if you want to get in particular back into those five factors, of what do you do when you're creating change in an organization. Um, this, the first one, the SCARF model, is something that David Rock came up with. And it's something that I, I actually, all my executive clients, that's something that we, um, that we go through as part of our coaching and that they've, um, they use as implementation guidance for changes that they're making in their organization. So it's a really nice little article. Um, the other book by David Rock is Your Brain at Work. And if you're interested in finding out how the brain works and how, what its impact is on your effectiveness at work, that's a, that's a really easy read. So now I'm opening it up to your questions first. And then, and then I've got an, an ask for you. Yes, ma'am. apply for and basically compete for this mm. three. So they went from 50 to three. And then we were told, you know, that's it. That's all that's going to mm. happen, you know, once it happens. And then Sorry. two months later, there was an IT shift and several people were laid off. So I feel that it's making my job much harder, even if I am being very transparent about knowledge, because that's exactly what they think. Mm -hmm. When I come and say, we need to share our knowledge, it's like, why? Are you trying to get rid of me? Like, well, so it makes it very hard. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So how do... We as managers try to help, I guess, our leadership to give. Yeah, leading up. I don't know. That's hard. That's hard. It is. It is. Um, and I don't have an easy answer. Um, yeah. You know, I, 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 yeah, every once in a while you get some of those clueless leaders that really don't, either don't know, um, don't care. Um, change, you know, change is sometimes, change is always not about the bottom line. It's about the people. Um, but there are, you know, there are reasons and financial reasons why things have to be done. And, and, I, and, and it's the caring and concern. And, and I, I know people that have downsized in organizations, and they left the organization on a really positive note because of how it was handled, because of the caring of the leaders. And, and if you're in, in here and the leader, you know, and you've got to try and lead up, that's really tough. Um, you can do what you can do, and you can maybe have that discussion and say, you know, here's what I'm seeing, and, you know, maybe we could do this, this, and this, and, and just suggest. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, you want to do what's best, and you want to be authentic to yourself. And so if you make the attempt to share your insights with that leader, and they choose to ignore it. I mean, you can go away saying, I, I tried my best. What, what happens, though, is like we, we don't have that conversation. And then we go, oh, I should have done this. And you know, so then we swirl around in regrets and go down in that vortex. Does that help? No, it does. Thank you. 
OK. The, the other thing I found is, is you know, I, I mentioned a couple of these different workshops. Sometimes you can have this kind of workshop, and you get everybody with a common language. And so we can correct each other about, hey, you know, you seem really frustrated. You know, you need to be up here. You know, you're really below the line today. You know, we can be more effective if we're above the line. How can I help you move there? So there was another question in the back someplace. I think that okay. this message of uh, we have to share our knowledge sometimes is managed more in the emotional realm. And I think, I think particularly in a negative environment, and a reality that organizations pass through it sometimes, you might have to move it more to the rational realm and you know develop a, a, a stronger business case, uh, uh, an example of well, you know, why is it worth it to share this knowledge? So. So we're wasting all our time documenting this knowledge if it just sits on hard drives or it's just the check. So mm -hmm. let's do something about it. But um, or you know we could really change the dialogue with this client if um, we get that above the line energy that opens up the possibilities of if we if we actually collaborated on our experiences with that client. You know, think of what a richer conversation we could have with them. You know, so there's that business effect, and then people also have a stake in that because they're all coming in with pieces and of And the mind. other thing I think that uh, can, can move it, and this goes back a little bit to the emotional realm, is tie it with recognition. Somehow that, you know, that, that the knowledge sharing results in some type of recognition. Mm -hmm. Well, one other thing that's not really part of this brain thing, but um, one thing I found that why it's so hard to make any kind of change, and particularly in the knowledge management piece, is we never change the system. So recognition, um, promotion, reward is all based on individual. It never effort. gets changed to be how much you collaborate or how much you contribute. So if, if you're not changing the reward system to reflect how you want to operate, um, the values that you want to espouse in a knowledge organization, knowledge-based organization, then, you know, you're, again, you know, why should I do that if it's going to hurt my chances for promotion? So it was like the same pushback with this, with this uh, academic organization, you know? Why should I put my research out there yeah. and, you know, somebody could take a look at that and maybe I'm going to be held accountable for something and, yeah. So if we don't, if we don't change the way the system um, supports us, which is another discussion, um, it, do, it doesn't happen. Any, no change will happen unless the system changes also. Yes, I know it wasn't intended to be, but it was very therapeutic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we'll meditate and breathe. <laughs> I do have a question, though, about two, two of your later comments. Um, one being we don't like to lose control. And the second being that we tend to favor the inward versus the outward. And, and I think the, the statement that you made was ultimately that we need to be as inclusive as possible um, with engaging people in solutions. But what if they don't want to be a part of the solution? Mm -hmm. then, then what? And I think that I, I'm being realistic. At least I think I'm being realistic. I think that there are people that want to come and do their thing, and anything beyond their thing, they're like, I'm out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Then what? Right. Um, yeah, ideally, everyone would have um, a reason to contribute. And, and, but there are those people. And, and particularly, I found, anyway, in the government, um, there's long standard pattern, patterns of behavior that have been allowed, and that just goes on and on and on. And it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to engage people. So, the, the um, two thoughts on that. One is that person is probably below the line in energy. So, they're protecting themselves for some reason, or they've got, you know, they've got a whole lot of other things going on in their life, and, you know, they're here to get their paycheck, do their work, and that's it. And, any other, you know, mental machinations, you know, they don't have time for that. So, I mean, it could be an attitude thing. It could be, um, it could be something else going on in their life. And, and I think as a, as a leader, when you find um, that there are people like that that are not 
coming along with the program, that's the time where you got to sit down and go, okay, you know, here's what I'm observing. This is the impact it's having. Um, what's going on for you? You know, this is going to be better for the organization. Are you, you know, how can I get you involved in it? What's, what's the stake? What's, the, what's in it for you, me? What's in it for me to, to be part of that? And, and there's always going to be 10% that they're just not. So you can, you can spend some, invest some capital in it, and then you got to say, hey, you know, sorry you're not going to play the game. We're doing this, and, you know, don't get in our way. <laughs> and, and, you know, eventually that becomes, they become the out. You know, so now, now you're in a situation where they're part of the out. You're trying to bring them in. Um, everybody needs to be managed in a different way. Um, some people have really deep wounds, and so they, they have this shell, and it's really hard to crack. Um, yeah, there is that 10% that's just not going to play, but um, a lot of times I'll have conversations with folks and say, you know, what would you rather be doing when you come in, into work? You know, well, you know, I'd really like to be doing this. Okay, well, if you give up some of your knowledge or if you get engaged and collaborate with us, you're probably going to have more time to go do the stuff that you really enjoy and provide more value add to the organization. <laughs> and so it helps them sort of release, you know, forwarding that knowledge and getting involved. That's a, that's a great suggestion. And I've actually, um, um, I'm working with a, with a client now, and he wanted a new way to engage us in getting, you know, kind of stale and, you know, they're just kind of status quo, right? And he really wants to move to a higher energy level in the organization. And so one of the things we talked about was having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with, with his uh, people, just a very least short one. You know, what are your priorities right now? What are my priorities? You know, what is it that, that you want to do in the organization? Where do you see the change happening? What would make your job better? And so having that kind of conversation, which we don't normally do, you know, we kind of wait for annual perform. I have a whole thing on performance reviews, annual feedback time, you know, like, you know, 10 months ago, you did this thing. Um, but more real time feedback like that about what's going on for you, what's going on in your life, getting to know people as a person. Um, sometimes that can help. But there are those people that you're just going to have to, you know, they'll be the out group and those, you know, you just keep, you keep the door open for them. What else? The in out group model is, I'm thinking of it as when I want to do change, I often start as that person outside the group. Mm. That's what I was thinking about as I hear and hear you think about that. My goal is to get in that group with my insidious plan. <laughs> that sounds interesting. <laughs> Weasel your way in so you can grab that knowledge and suck it out and go. <laughs> yeah. So the thing around the in and out group is kind of interesting because it's come up in a couple of articles and this has nothing to do with this topic, sorry, um, about, you know, race relations. You know, how do we understand better the other, the other side? And, and there's that level of understanding, but if you're part of, you know, a very definite group structure, um, we can't, you as an in-group person of, of white males has a hard time being as empathetic to, um, to women, even though, even though you want to, um, as somebody that's in that in-group. And, and it's just, it's, it's kind of like bias. It's this unconscious bias, which is, a, which is another workshop about how the brain responds to that and, ha and how, again, knowing that, now you can stand outside yourself <laughs> and, and start to deal with that in a, in a more objective way and say, you know, I know, I know that I can't necessarily understand, but I'm really going to try versus having this, um, you know, like a lack of empathy of, of, of what people are going through. Um, what else? So I haven't asked. Okay, okay, one more. Um, so, is all change a threat, or is it changes that I don't understand or that I don't want? Mm -hmm. Because if it's a change that I understand and I want, I might not be threatened by it. Right. So yes. The the slide on change equals threat. That's where my mind went. And not all change is a threat, but I guess like change that I don't want or don't understand. 
So there's always, even, even if it's a change that you want, there's always going to be some anxiety around that. So whether it's a threat like lion in your face threat or whether it's just some anxiety and some generation of, of uh, a little bit of neurochemicals to get you engaged and, and energized around it, or it can be too much. And, and that's, so, so change is, is always going to trigger some kind of detection because our, our natural way of doing things is to, you know, s stay in a homeostasis state. And so any kind of change, even the one that you want, you're, it's going to be less of a threat, um, but there's always going to be that uncertainty about how it's all going to work out. You know, if you're trying to make a personal change about losing weight, getting in shape, you know, are you, am I going to be able to stick with it? Am I going to be tempted to do, you know, go off of my change plan? Does that help? Okay. With respect to that, the, I mean, understanding kind of the neurobiological responses to change and, you know, that it's like, oh, great, but not know what's going to happen. Um, it's, oh, great, I got a new job in a new city. Oh, no, now I have to go do all these other things. My question, I think, is about knowing when change is afoot in an organization, what is your opinion about knowing that it, we don't know, you know, you've got a room of 100 people and change is going to affect everybody. We don't know to what extent, we don't know what it looks like for them, we don't know how, you know, they're reacting. So what do we do? Um, do we engage with them? Do we do, you know, inquiry of, of saying, okay, you know, you don't want to run around 100 people that you work with and say, how do you feel today? Like, I don't know that I would do that. But, I mean, that seems to be the, the, like a building block of going, okay, to be able to understand what the impact is that, that these, these people are, are experiencing to then transition to another part of that change right. dynamic. I mean, is that advisable? Is that not? I mean, how do so a lot of people, for most people, they just want to be heard. So having maybe small group discussions around, all right, this is, this is what we know about the change. And, and as, a, as a leader, putting yourself in that vulnerable category of, well, I don't know how this is all going to work out, but together we're going to work through it and I'm going to keep you informed. Um, so having those small group discussions perhaps about what's concerning you about this? You know, what's coming up? So maybe there's some, you know, as a manager, I don't know what's going on for you, but maybe you're going to bring something up. Well, if you change this, then this is going to happen. Oh, you know, I never realized that. Maybe we need to look at that. So sometimes it's enough just to be heard. I don't necessarily have to act on what you say, but I can explain why I can't. So, and, and not, not just listening, being heard. I mean, I mean, listening deeply so that I actually hear what you're saying. Not like, okay, you know, you know how we do. Oh, all that town hall stuff, great. Thanks, bye. Okay. We are, uh, we're, we're done. I'll stay around for a few minutes if you want to ask other questions. And thank you.